Welcome to the webinar. We'll be starting in just a few minutes. If you wouldn't mind while you're coming in, in the chat box, go ahead and, and let us know where you're watching us from today. It's always interesting to see just how widely people are interested in different topics. I know spotted wing drosophila being as much of an issue as it has been, um, we were expecting a pretty wide ranging audience from different places around the country and even our neighbors to the north up in Canada. We're going to give it about another minute or so for folks to file in. We've had over 300 people register for the webinar this time around. Pretty good numbers for, for uh, this type of event. I know I'm excited to hear about how biocontrol for spotted wing drosophila has advanced. And for those who are just jumping in now, um, if you want to go ahead in the chat, mention where you're from. Um, we always like to kind of see the uh, the the spread of people we have. Looks like we have Georgia, Virginia, New Jersey, North Carolina, Connecticut, Mississippi. More New York, got some Maine, a lot of Georgia, which I would kind of expect. And we have our person furthest away. We have someone from Turkey today. And Scotland. Truly international conference for this morning. Just a couple more minutes while we let people join up. A little bit of Portugal, Washington State. For those just joining, we're going to get started here in just a minute. Want to give just a little more time for people to file into the room. Um, while they're doing that, if you want to type into the chat where you're watching us from today, we always like to, to see the diversity. We've had a, a number of international folks. I mean, Scotland, Turkey, Portugal, that's, that's pretty good. And Canada. I knew Canada was going to be here in here at some point. <clears throat> We have Chile represented as well. See how many continents we can get represented by looking at all this. Okay, we are now one after. That's probably enough time for everyone to come in. Thank you for coming to this webinar today on advances in biocontrol for management of spotted wing drosophila. Very excited to see these presentations today. A um, little bit of meeting logistics, getting started. If you have questions at all during the presentation, there is a Q&A box down on the bar. It's next to your chat. The Q&A box will help us make sure that we answer any question you ask about spotted wing drosophila. So if you go ahead and put your questions in the Q&A, if you have technical difficulties or something else, you can use the chat for that. And we'll be watching that to follow up in case um, anyone has any issues hearing us or other things going on during the webinar. Um, so good, good to know where those meeting controls are. At the end of the webinar, there will be a survey just to get more information about you know, what you thought of this webinar and help improve these programs in the future. So please do stick around to fill that out. Um, so with that, uh, I'm gonna turn this over to Ash Sayal. Ash is uh, moderating this webinar and, and one of the leaders of the SWD team. Good morning, everybody in good afternoon and whatever applies to wherever you are based at. Thank you so very much for joining our webinar today. This webinar is a, a presentation 
by Sustainable SWD Management SCRI project team, which is a multi-regional team that has been working on SWD for several years. Today, we will talk about advances in biological control for management of spotted wing drosophila. Spotted wing drosophila is a vinegar fly of Asian origin. It was first detected in the mainland US in 2008, and since then it has spread throughout United States and also worldwide. It, has, it is one of the most devastating pests of small fruits fruit growers have ever experienced. Females of this vinegar fly uh, lay eggs in, develop, in developing or uh, ripening or ripe berries. And uh, once eggs are laid, they develop to adult to go through the development stages to develop into adults in eight to 10 days at 25 degrees centigrade, which means that it can go through several generations within one season to build up populations really high levels. Uh, as you see, the damage in a blueberry shown below on this slide from a healthy berry to uh, a progression of the damage. Female, once female lay eggs, eggs develop in, within the fruit into larvae, larvae start feeding, and within a few days, the a normal, otherwise marketable fruit turns into unmarketable fruit. Uh, and the impact, overall impact of this fly uh, was estimated to be $718 million in terms of crop losses and also increased management costs of $129 million. This, these estimates were made in 2014. Since then, the impact may have increased. This does mean that it is one of the most devastating pests uh, we have ever seen. This team has done a lot of work through other projects to build initial uh, uh, information about bi biology and ecology of SWD and address uh, uh, the urgent issues. However, the main goal of this SCRI project is to develop and deliver systems-based integrated management programs to berry and cherry growers that are cost-effective and environmentally sustainable for long-term management of SWD in the US and uh, worldwide. Uh, this goal will be achieved under the specific objectives, which are to implement uh, best management programs for sustainable SWD management in collaboration with the grower influencers, uh, develop uh, economics-based decision aid tools to support identification and implementation, of profit maximizing uh, SWD management strategies. Uh, evaluate sustainable alternatives to long-term management of SWD, which include behavioral control and biological control. Assess and reduce the risk of insecticide resistance development in SWD. And lastly, develop and disseminate actionable recommendations that enable producers to optimize pest management decisions and evaluate their impact. Uh, this uh, project, as I mentioned, is a multi-regional project, which does include uh, several uh, states and uh, land-grant universities, as you can see here. And uh, work is currently being done on all of those objectives in different states across the United States. Today's webinar will focus on biological control or advances in biological control of SWD and the presenters for today's webinar in, uh, are uh, our um, team members, Kent Dana, who is a, a faculty member at University of California, Berkeley, and Shang King, who is a USDA research scientist uh, in Delaware. So at this point, I'll pass it on to Kent Dana to start with the uh, webinar to the next level. Thank you, Ash. As I wait for control of the screen. Yeah. So today I've been tasked with giving background on how we got to our present day biocontrol work. A lot of what's been done in the past has been put in these three review articles. 
um, from Shen King Wang, John Ali, and another chapter by Shen King. And these can be found online at the SWD website that's housed in Georgia. Well, Ash mentioned the costs that we have for SWD control. We think biocontrol has to be an integral part of any management practice, and it actually supports insecticide use. We've already seen some resistance to insecticides develop in some regions with some products. Biological control will mostly reduce the pressure of spotted wing by working in some of the riparian areas next to our cash crop. Lowering the amount of SWD coming into your cash crop will improve the insecticide usage and reduce the increased resistance that we're seeing. We also know that biocontrol has been a part already, even without manipulation. Work in Maine showed that about 80% of the SWD will pupate in the soil. Well, down in the soil, there's all kinds of natural enemies. And early work showed that exposed pupa are oftentimes predicted upon by a number of different natural enemies. This was also shown in Oregon. They looked at SWD pupa and larva exposed or ex exclosed from natural enemies. And they found when SWD pupa and larva were exposed to natural enemies, there was always a significant reduction. So some of the common natural enemies we find are ants, spiders, uh, general predators, and parasitoids. That's that top picture, a pupal parasitoid. In fact, there are two kinds of pupal parasitoids uh, in North America, one pachycropoideus and the other trichopria. Uh, groups in Minnesota, Oregon, and California looked at manipulating these pupal parasitoids that are naturally here in North America and in Europe. We released tens of thousands of pachycropoideus. And while we did get a increase in percentage parasitism, and in some cases, a slight decrease in SWD, we felt it wasn't economically viable enough to be a good alternative to some of the more standard conventional practices. I will mention that other groups working with Trichopria, uh, another pupil parasitoid, a uh, group in Mexico, a group in California, have shown a reduction in spotted wing, and they do feel like this is a practice that deserves closer attention, closer merit. But we decided to work with, rather than the resident parasitoids, classic biocontrol. So what is the idea behind classic biocontrol? You've got a pest population which is working above the economic injury level or threshold. You go to the pest's native range, in this case, Asia, and you look for a natural enemy, which is both safe and effective. And instead of releasing like an augmentation program, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of these natural enemies, you release fewer amounts, but the idea is that they are going to establish in the environment and they will naturally increase in density, bringing the pest population down and they oscillate below the economic injury level. So our hope was to find natural enemies in Asia that would provide some level of control. We had two areas where we focused our foreign exploration. Uh, we started in 2011, we continued through 2017, making 10 collection trips to South Korea and in the uh, Yunnan region of China, which is in South Central China. You can see our collection on the timeline below. In fact, we actually made another trip in 2022. And as Shinking will mention, we plan on making more collections in the future. Uh, we could not have done this without cooperation. So you could see here in the colored circles, we're collecting in China, South Korea, and Japan. This was an international effort. We worked with colleagues in Cabi, Switzerland, in Italy, a USDA lab in um, 
uh, Delaware and Oregon and California had all members making these collections. So it was a true international effort. And what was great is that we all came up with the same results, the same ideas of which parasitoids are important. All together, we brought back 19 different parasitoid species from these Asian collections. Most were in these groups, Briconidae and Fagididae. And we can see here in red, there were three species that we thought were very important, a Briconid, Asabara japonica, and two Fagidids, a Gnaspis, and one called Leptoplina japonica. They also had the pupil parasitoids, Pachycropoideus and Trichopria, that we find in both North America and Europe as well. So we focused our quarantine, our tensions, on Asabara japonica, Gnaspis, what was called Brasiliensis, and Leptopolina japonica. Now, these are very small parasitoids. We see here the two Fagidids, Gnaspis and Leptopolina. They're just a little bit over a millimeter in size, so about the length of the nose of Roosevelt on a dime that we see up above. Uh, these two parasitoids look fairly similar. We can tell them apart, but taxonomy becomes an important part of this introductory story. So Gnaspis and Leptoplina are the two Fagidids, and we also looked in quarantine at Asobar japonica. So this is one of these Fagidids in action. Uh, we can see here it lays an egg into a first or second instar larva of the spotted wing Drosophila. We can see that the first instar kind of stays inside the developing um, fly larva, fly maggot, until it gets to the pupal stage. We can see a picture of the pupa. We see that little, it's about a first or second instar larva moving inside that pupa and it chews up and eats the spotted wing from the inside out. And then it emerges as an adult. And we can see here that's a boy, uh, fidgeted. Right. So what I want to do is give an idea of the kinds of parasitism we found in Asia, and that will give us an indication of what we can expect with these parasitoids released in North America. In the 2013 and 2014 collections in South Korea, in 2013, we were putting out sentinel fruit, like slices of banana or blackberries that we bought in the store. And we put these in the field and we mostly reared out this Asobara japonica. This was for a large reason because we were getting a lot of other Drosophila flies, a lot of uh, common vinegar flies like Drosophila melanogaster. In 2014, we started to use both these sentinel fruit and ripe fruit collected. Now we're getting more Gnaspis and Leptopolina. In 2016 in South Korea and 2016 in China, we're now only collecting ripening fruit, and now we're getting a majority of Gnaspis and Leptopolina. But there was variation. There was variation depending on what kind of fruit samples we collected in our uh, region. So first, what kind of host plants we were looking at. You could see here parasitism on rubus and this little wild mountain strawberry was about 20%. We can see with one of the rubus species, rubus nevius, we were getting more leptoplina than we were getting gnaspis. And on elderberry, sambucus, we got very high levels of parasitism, almost 60% on average. That might be because of the host plant size. The larger the fruit, the further down inside the fruit, the spotted wing larva can dig, and that might get it out of reach of these parasitoids ovipositors, where the elderberry berry was quite small, and so the maggot has uh, less area to go deeper into, and it's more exposed to the oviposition. Um, we also saw variation in the different areas. So we expect variation depending on where we're releasing this, Maine versus California. We can see here three areas of China. One uh, where we had two rubus species, 
dominated by Leptopelina. One where we had uh, this Western strawberry, elderberry and rubus dominated by Ganaspis. And one where it was just Rubus nevius, no Ganaspis whatsoever. So we expect to see some variation as well where we're releasing in North America. So once we find these parasitoids, a big part of this initial work was doing quarantine studies and looking at the taxonomy of these different parasitoids. We have to do quarantine studies to look at their biology, find out which is the most effective, but also make sure they're not gonna do any harm. And we have to make sure we have the taxonomy correct to know exactly what we're releasing. So the biology studies were doing things like looking at the adult longevity and fecundity, meaning how many spot and wing can they kill. We found that both Leptopelina and Ganaspis, uh, Ganaspis in the top graph, Leptopelina in the bottom graph, were very similar in their biology. Uh, in this study, for example, both lived about 18 days and both killed about 100 spot and wing Drosophila. We also wanted to look at their competitive advantages, uh, how they interact with each other. This is looking at a parasitoid's functional response. Basically, how many fly do they kill depending on how many fly we give them? Uh, we found that Asabara, the Reconid, was the most aggressive, followed by Leptopelina, and closely followed after Leptopelina by Ganaspis. And in fact, with other studies, we found their competition followed the same way. Asabara would outcompete the two Fujitids, and Leptopelina was a little bit better in competition than Ganaspis. But by far the most important work in quarantine is what do they have in terms of their impact on non-target flies. One of the important aspects of getting a permit to release any of these natural enemies is that it causes no harm to non-targets or very little harm will come from this. So we can see Drosophila suzukii on the left is our target species. When we looked at Asobara japonica, the Braconid, it killed just about everything we gave it. So it doesn't have a very uh, small non-target impact. Um, compare that to Leptopelina japonica. It really attacked about six of the different fly species we gave it, and about four others that had a tiny amount of impact on it. So a little bit more of a specialist, but still with a fairly wide host range. When we looked at Ganaspis species, really they were attacking Drosophila suzukii, Drosophila melanogaster, and Drosophila simulans. These are all closely, closely related species. And in fact, the taxonomist showed that this Ganaspis could be broken down into two groups that were attacking spotted wing or very, very closely related species. We can break this apart molecularly. One, we, we refer to as the G1 group and another as the G3 group. And in fact, these might be different species altogether. The G1 group was easily the most specialized. And in fact, in some studies, only attacked Drosophila suzukii. It was also the most common. So both in South Korea and in China, the G1 group made up about 67 to 77% of the material we reared out of spot and wing. So this was um, the target insect for our petition. Our first petition submitted in 2016, we requested to release both Ganaspis, G1 and G3, and Leptopelina. In 2017, that request was rejected because Leptopelina seemed to be a little bit too broad in terms of its host range. And we were asked for a better description of the G1 versus G3 uh, Ganaspis. So we did more quarantine work, submitted a, another petition in 2019 for the release of the Ganaspis brasiliensis G1 strain. 
that was approved in 2021. And in 2022, we started to do our releases. During this time, we developed better insectary rearing techniques. And we started to work with uh, different regional insectaries. So this wasn't just being reared in one or two main places. So what Shin King is going to do is, is describe our progress with the release of Gnaspis, the G1 material, in our different regional insectaries. In green, we see all the states that are permitted for releasing this. And in yellow, those are the states where we have new requests out for releasing this material there as well. And while this happened, we had accidental introduction of Leptopelina japonica in British Columbia, which has been spreading to not just the close states of Washington and now Oregon, but also to other reaches within uh, North America. And Shin King will also describe some of that work that's going on uh, and the Gnaspa studies as well. So with that, I will turn this over to Dr. Wang. Thank you, um, Ken. Hi, Van Wing. So I'm going to, uh, let me see if I can control this nice. Okay. So I'm going to provide the update on the, uh, first on the nationwide effort to release Galaspis in the US. And then I'm going to highlight the in a little more detail the release and monitoring of the special in different states as well as few studies from the different lab from the team. And finally, I'm going to discuss a little bit about what we're going to do in the near future. So this map shows the nationwide uh, effective release of this glass piece uh, in the US. So the release started last year and continues this year. So we had a 12 state conduct release last year, and this year we increased to 15 states. Uh, this is nearly in a show a nationwide effort. So far, this has involved 14 universities and three UAD labs and two state departments of agriculture. So 10 labs from this ACI team, and we collaborated with not different labs, for example, in Oregon, and the UCD Jonas lab, and uh, uh, the Department of Agriculture, Max NAP, collaborating with Von SNAP uh, from AC, uh, OSU for releasing in Oregon and in California, um, Brian Hogan SNAP from USDA and collaborating, collaborating with Ken SNAP in releasing in California. And also in the East Coast, um, in Delaware, we are collaborating with Penn State University with Kathleen. Kelly and David also was um, uh, was in University of Maryland was uh, Kelly in the least in the three state. And in North Carolina, um, Hannah D. Carbody was the North Carolina Department of Agriculture was Greg and Maza in the least there. And we have more, a lot of some states, they, you know, they don't have funded by this part, but funded by the other project or by their department like in New Hampshire. And I did release this year in New Hampshire and also Oscar releasing in Florida and also the Mary releasing in uh, Minnesota. So this is generally sure, you know, the nearly nationwide effort for release the special toys in the US. And this map shows the number of the special so far released in the US. And so the green circles indicating the number released last year and the net circles indicating the number released this year. And so we totally had released about 51,000 waspers last year and the number this year is almost doubled. And also in Oregon State, they started releasing the other press stores this year, about at least 2,000 maybe the banana. Some states are maybe you know, doing better in learning, so at least more number like in Michigan, Oregon, New Jersey, and Georgia, this full state in this so far of 15,000 waspers. So after the release, we monitoring 
and they establish and the recovery of those pesticides. Uh, in some states, we using uh, monitoring through the flow sampling. Some other states also monitoring through the center surface. And so far, I've I've got all the data from last year. This year, you know, the, some states still process their data, so another variable. But I will show you a few states later. Um, so from last year, from few sampling, this eight states, um, there about for the location. 192 sites are surveyed and at above the 800 sample and collect about 39 kilogram of fruits from at least 40 different um, plant species. Um, by the way, this number must be anti-smith because I don't uh, get a complete data from some state. And so all the specimens we collect last year have been identified, sent to um, Dr. Dana Gallaby from uh, Agriculture and agri food in Canada, uh, in Antenna. And so she did all the molecular ID to confirm the specimens. Also, some species sent to Dr. Matt Bafting on uh, the UCAI's best field lab for morphological ID. And so the data from NASA is almost complete. We, Tana and I, we are going to work in with everybody to put, put up the paper uh, very soon. So this map shows the recovery of the galaspis from last year's release. So the needs we recover about 172 specimens from this five state in Washington State, Oregon, and also in Pennsylvania, Delaware, and uh, Maryland. And also uh, some specimens are recovered from Santa Trevor from Georgia and uh, Oregon. As Ken mentioned before, you know, during the last year's fruit sampling, we found that um, the, the between like almost in every sample state, as Ms. Mapshu, also in Canada, in Antenna, it seems widely established of the species. So we collect about 2,700 specimens of the Nibitabina from fruit sampling, and also about 155 specimens from the sand trip. Um, this wasp was known to establish in British Columbia before um, by Paul Eben. They published paper in 2020, but also in Northwest Washington State by Basie Bills. But now it seems this widely is, uh, um, established almost everywhere we sampled except California. So this table show the give you the idea of you know, what the penalties look like overall in different states. And so I also put the number of samples. This is larger samples in some state. You can see like for them in Maryland, they, they collected above 1,000, over 1,000 specimens of the Nebuchadnezzar and the penetration average is about 41%. And also in Oregon, the penetration is about 43% based on the flu sampling. So this is, yeah, very impressive. Um, so in some states, the special seems well established. And those are the associated host plant that the both specials are collect from. Um, I also have to say this number must be underestimated because a lot of the host plant species are not able to identify the species. Like for example, in the East area, I think we have a lot different variety of honeysuckers. And we have a lot of wild blackberry and raspberry that uh, have not been identified species. But at least the show, you know, these 15 host plants that are associated with this Nibitabina and both seven different plants associated with the Glaspis. Um, what why does the Nibitabina have been recorded from at least 47 um, plant species in Asia, Europe, and also in North America, and about the uh, the gasp was, was collectible from 33 different host plants. But a lot of this record in this table are new record from North America and based on last year's sampling. I'm sure there's the number will increase uh, in the future. So that's the overall result. I'm not going to show you a little bit of more details in each state. Um, let me start with our state in Delaware. So I'm here working with uh, Amanda Kim uh, in the New York Delaware, so our UCN app. 
Um, we have uh, we have a quantine facility. We maintain a lot of exhaust pest natural enemies, including the spot wind to soften up. So we maintain the parent colony of this species that everybody has released so far, all from the same colony. And we have distributed this colony to at least 17 different neighbors across the US for learning and need some neighbors using for research. We also produce this wasp for release here in Delaware, Maryland, and Pennsylvania. We still maintain several different species of the spawn to solve pestoids collected from Asia. So I'm going to give you a little more details on the lease industry. That we are collaborating with Kenny Henry from University of Maryland, also Kathleen Armchuk and Kenny Lincoln and David Bedingo from Penn State University. So in this three state, we release three sites each year, and we get a three release. We release about 500 to 1,000 watts for each release. From last year's release, we collect both pest toys in all of these sites in Delaware and some sites in Pennsylvania and Maryland. And this year, just before the first release, we conduct some pretty survey and collapse was recovered at least in Pennsylvania and Delaware. So it seems the wasp has established from Nazi's releases. Uh, just give you a little bit more information about the food sampling in Delaware. So in Delaware, we are known, we are focused on the establishment. We wanted the wasp to establish food. So we conducted release and sampling mainly in the same nature area. Two sides are the state parks, and one is the uh, University of Delaware farmland. This is the area host plenty of wild host plant, and we think this is the area you know less less uh, disturbed and maybe help the wasp to establish first. So we collect different host plant. We had about ninety sampling and collect about ten different host plant each year. And here I just show the season dynamics of the SMLD and the pedotism throughout the season. And so, um, so we collect the fruit over the season based on the temporal pattern of fruit availability. Now in our area, mobile is one of the first fruit mature in only June. And then with season progress, we have this one berry, last berry, blackberry, and later on. In late fruit season, we have honeysuckle, and even in late October, we still have honeysuckle available in the field. So as you see in our areas, fly appeal in early July, um, and then the wasp will also appear at the same time. And then the lychee peak around the August. And after August, the fly population crashed, and also the pedotism declined um, by the end of fruit season. Uh, there's a little bit of difference in, among the, the two different years. Like, uh, this year, the bush fly and wasp appear a little bit early than last year. But overall, you see the pattern is very, very similar. And those, as those are the very common host plants we collect from, from just three state. So overall, you know, this white nubus are the main host plant in the early flu season. And middle season, like the honeysuckle on the autumn models are the main host plant. And the, this, you know, the pest range in our areas was as high as 80% almost. And so this is just the very, very common host plant. I think very, very similar in other different Eastern uh, state. Okay, the next uh, release is in uh, Michigan. This data was provided by Steve and Ruth's from the University of uh, Michigan. So they conduct a very extensive survey, I think from last year and this year. Last year they surveyed 170 sites, this year 242 sites, and they collect 1,000 samples each year. And this map shows all different sites they collect. Mainly they also surveyed the semi digital areas. So this is their result, this number of SWD and pestoids wasp emerging over the season. Uh, in Michigan, it seems the fly come out a little bit later than Delaware, so about around the middle of July, and wasp even later around the late of June, July, or only August. 
But their pattern uh, look very, very similar to what we found in Delaware. So he both fly and petrol reach the peak on the August and then decry uh, in September. And so they're still uh, collecting the 2030 um, data. And this the host plant where they both fly and wasp are uh, emerging. So you can, as you can see, you know, uh, in in Michigan, um, blackberry, oldberry, blueberry. This is and spray blueberry and pumpkin. This seems the main host plant in Michigan, and the you know they're all very similar from both both years. Very consistent. Okay, the next is the uh, some update from the main state, and this data was provided by Ben and Phil from Phil Snap. So you mean they also conducted the lease and monitoring last year and this year, then leasing full size last year and five size this year, and they um, monitor the, the after the lease was both full sampling and single trip. So last year, due to hit the waiver, they are not able to conduct full sampling. But this year, they conduct full sampling. They have two release size. They also have two non-release control size. They collect above nine eight hundred the pizzabina from the post release site, and about ten aspies from the release site. But they didn't find any wasp from non-release control size. Uh, in May, it seems is the wasp come out even later in August and in September, further later than uh, Michigan and Delaware. But from this year's full sampling, they get above, like, in some data, it got above 90 or 70% parotism, almost 76. So it's also very impressive. From the center trip, they recovered last year 93, the Benina, and this year only one. And so they think you know, center trip can be inconsistent. It's because it you know, depends on where you put the trip in the area, for example, if you have a lot of white fruit that could compete with your center trip. So they suggest fruit sampling are ideal. This is true as Ken just mentioned in the issue, you know, and during the survey, we recovered this pestles mainly from food sampling, very, very few from the food trap. And I think, uh, you know, in this uh, and determine the habitat, you know, probably it's ideal to, to monitoring the established and, uh, um, you know, the, uh, the beginning of the leases. Okay, this is the release in uh, Georgia, the data provided by Ash and Senna. So in Georgia, they release in nine location and 18 different size. So last year they released about 10,000 waspers, this year about 6,000 waspers. And this all these size uh, show their release. Um, from last year release, they recovered the collapse from a uh, scent trap in one side. And this year they found the galaspies from full sampling in size close to the uh, the scent trap where they found the galaps last year. It seems so it seems the galaps is also established in Georgia. Okay, here's the release in uh, North Carolina, the data provided by Hannah and uh, Kenna and also the collaborating with Great and Maza from North Korea, North Korea Department of Agriculture. So last year they released in three size, and this year in four different size. So they recovered the, the Pizipina last year, and this year they haven't processed all the data yet. So this is released in New Jersey, um, data provided by uh, Caesar. Um, they are collaborating with uh, uh, Eric and Angra from the New Jersey uh, Field Programming Beneficial Insects Learning Lab. This never have done very well in learning this wasp. So their number and, and doubled the list about 5,000 last year in five different size. And this year, the number doubled and also size doubled in at least 10 different size uh, in Southern New Jersey. 
Um, they recover both the Neptopenina uh, and Gaspis last year, and this year they have recovered at least the Neptopenina. Um, this is a release in New York um, by Greg Snap. And so they um, release in four different sites this year and last year, and each site received about 600 waspers. Uh, last year, they collected the Bibina in all different sites. This year, they collected the Bibina, but also seems to collect the Gaspis, although the data is still uh, waiting for confirmation. So this is a recent monitoring in California that are provided by Brain and Can Snap. And so in California, they did a recent full size last year, but they um, didn't recover last piece of releases. Also, they released the, in the in the Kijo test, they didn't recover the last piece. And so this year they increased the release size to 80 size, and they have recovered glass, but the least in one side, they also expanded their sampling. Uh, to the further north near the um, Oregon border. This is some new size they, they started this year of sampling uh, to see whether the walls were moving in from uh, Oregon because this is establishing Oregon already. Now I'm going to highlight a few studies from different lab and um, this first study is about the cool storage of this galaspis. Um, this is primarily done by Fabrizio Nisa. Uh, Fabrizio Nisa is a visiting PG student from the University of Cantel, uh, Catania at the Kent Snap in Shibokane. What the key one tried to look at is whether we are able to store the waspers so that, so that we can accumulate enough number for the lease because it's sometimes difficult to lease larger number at one time. So he looked at the two different temperatures, 10 and 15 degree, and four different exposure times from two up to eight weeks and three different pastoral stage, larval, pupae, and fully the dot. Uh, Fabrizio provide a lot of slides, but I'm I'm just going to highlight. So the take home information is that the free adult is not a good stage. As you can see, very, very no emergency need. Pupil is good only for the short period, about two weeks. Well, now is good for up to six weeks for a 10 degree and up to four weeks at the, um 15 degree. So he look at not only the emergency data, but also I look at the longevity, fecundity, and develop time. But overall, you know, from his study, he concluded that uh, um, pupil stage probably is the best stage. You can start at 10 or 15 degree for two weeks. So that will not affect the pastoral fitness. That means we can prepare, you know, two weeks in advance for the least you can start pasteurized at the pupil stage in the two temperatures, and then you can accumulate the number you know, over the two, three weeks. So this is the uh, really very useful uh, for us for the learning for release in the future. Also, his study indicating another stage can be stored, but it will affect a little bit of the fitness of the post-storage pasteurized. Okay, this study is provided by a uh, basis net from Washington State University, uh, primarily done by Lob. So what they tried to look at the, what's the best method to collect those fidgetitis. So they compared five different methods, full sampling, centrio trap, one uh, vinegar trap, and also um, century root trap and yellow stick car and century root trap. So they did a study in Northwest Washington state where both petals has well, have very well established. And what they found is the um, wine vinegar chirp and century nula chirp seems to are the best method to collect those pastoids from monitoring those pastoids. And they didn't find anything from the fruit centers. But I think the full sampling is also very important. So we know where the walls come from, which kind of host plant. So yeah, so this is also very useful for monitoring 
and the press toys after releases. Well, this study provided by uh, Von Snap in Oregon. So basically, they want to look at uh, what changes after 10 years. 10 years ago, the SNAP conducted probably the first uh, um, you know, survey on the pest toys that associated with this invasive species in Oregon. At the time, we, we haven't started these any waspers and we don't know. But this is 10 years past, they want to see what has changed. So they went to back to the three sites. They did the survey 10 years ago. The one size is the Selma, Oregon, where they put a trap in blueberry cob, also nearby the white black, black, blackberry uh, field. At that time, they found prim primand uh, primarily the uh, pupils of the packet point vinibus and then a few of the uh, novel pets of the this the uh being like your trauma, that's the wasp. They can attack spot wing, but they're able to wear from some probably wear from the softener monogasta. So this is the 10 years ago. Well, today they put a more trap and they found predominantly the wasp is, is the adventive population of the Bina Japonica. And you see most in most size. 90% of this wasp that they covered is the adventive population of the Nibitabinina uh, Japonica. And then the result is very similar for the, for the other two sites in Jefferson and then Corvallis. They very consistent. So that doesn't mean you know, the Nibitabinina Japonica now is the dominant pest toys in Oregon. Okay, this is a study provided by Ashnab and primarily done by Zubin. So they look at the uh, non-target effects of selective insect size on gaspis and also on pachycarpus polyvinyl mice. So they tested nine common pesticides they use for control is WD, and they look at the NASA and sub NASA effects. So they look at the survival of this post to the to the recommended rate of application, but also look at the seven laser effect of AOC ten, you know, on the survival for quantity and offspring uh, fitness of the pest toys. Um, so we provide me a lot of different size, but I'm just going to show you the conclusion from the study. So, so overall, you know, they they found that uh, all the Pesticide treatment have have affected this. All the treatment have affected the pesticides pesticism, as well as the fecundity, particularly for the P. vinyamai, but also affect the offspring sex ratio, but does not affect the uh, offspring develop time. Um, I I probably missed one slide. This is the overall result. Okay, I'm just going to show you the last two studies provided by Greg Snap in Cornell University. So this study, the first study, look at the host selection behavior by host pest toys. Basically, they look at how the wasp will respond to these uh, volume cues from infest versus uninfest blueberry or raspberry, or from infest blueberry versus infest raspberry. And, and so they did this test in the alphagometer by assay, but they didn't find any difference. It seems both pesticides can respond to both the infested and infested uh, blueberry or raspberry. And then the second study provides them, they look at the uh, into specific competition and outcome between the two pesticides in blueberry or raspberry. So basically they released two female of each species unknown, or one female from each species. And then they look at the outcome in terms of the pedicism. In general, they found that two species working together better than one species unknown. And so this is the only good news, you know, uh, can also mention before during the uh, survey in Asia, you know, we found both species coexist. And so since they can work in together, We, uh, 
So this is the map we predict the potential distribution of GASPs uh, based on the habitat suitability. And so it seems that it can establish a larger area from uh, Pacific Northwest to Midwest and to Eastern USA. So I think we are, we are happy because the between are already established and we hopefully the Galapagos were also established and hopefully they can work together, you know, to bring down this following um, population. So, so in the future, I think we should try, we should continue the release and monitoring the establishment as well as the impact of the two pest toys on the S3D. But we still need a lot to know about the field ecology, like what kind of weather condition will affect the establishment, how the host panel will affect their efficiency, and how the specific interaction between them and the other pesticides will play out. The other thing is very important that we want to mention, you know, the species we released, we only come from the wing population that has around the Tokyo area was collected from Japan. And if you look at this map, those petals are widely distributed in East uh, Asia and their native languages. So there's, I think there's not a potential you know, to explore the genetic growth in the source. Particularly, we want to look at some key ecological traits like uh, climatic adaptability, you know, maybe we should you know, further optimize the selection of different trees. In case some area, the glass was not able to stem, we might be looking for the population from different areas in Asia. And the thought to build the climatic resistant bike system for this uh, pest. And also I think we should promote the impact of this pest or the try by using reducer risky uh, insecticide as ashes a study, never study issue in some pest as where they can affect those pest toys. Um, I think I'm going to end up here. Thank you for your attention. Uh, Ash, I bet we'll go back to you. All right. Thank you again. Thank you, Kent and uh, Shan King, for giving us a detailed overview of the uh, efforts of our team. Uh, again, to uh, you know, summarize, SWD is one of the most devastating and persistent pests we have ever seen in small fruits. And an integrated approach consisting of a combination of chemical, biological, behavioral, and cultural tactics is needed to control such a pest. Biological control, of course, is one of the most sustainable pest management strategies to control SWD. Uh, as part of this uh, SCRI project, we have a massive and nationwide effort ongoing to rear and release these exotic natural enemies in and around small food farms. Uh, with the goal uh, that uh, once established, these exotic natural enemies will contribute to lowering uh, of SWD populations in the long run. Uh, again, uh, if you are interested in releasing natural uh, exotic natural enemies uh, at your farm, please contact one of our, our team members uh, from your state, or uh, if your state does not have one of the team members, please contact us and we will make arrangements to release uh, exotic uh, parasitoids at your farm. And one last message that I want to give, as uh, those uh, pesticide compatibility studies showed, uh, most of the pesticides do have toxic impacts, negative impacts uh, on uh, these natural enemies. And when we develop an integrated approach that does comprise of all tactics, we want to keep in mind that uh, we try to use either reduced risk insecticides with minimal uh, non-target impact on these beneficials, or we uh, apply those products in such a manner that we will minimize overall non-target impact on these beneficials so we can take advantage of these uh, uh, exotic natural enemies and overall uh, keep the, these SWD populations uh, lower in the long run. So, uh, so our team, as I mentioned, is a multi-regional team. We already have developed a uh, a project website is swdmanagement.org. 
a recording of this webinar will also be posted on that website within the next couple of days. So if you would like to revisit this webinar or those who were not able to attend this webinar, they can always visit our website and watch this whole webinar over there. And uh, our team members in different states and regions have also developed lots of resources that are available online in different states. Uh, some are mentioned on this slide, for example, this uh, uh, swd.ipm uh, in Western region. Here we have uh, North uh, Carolina IPM Center, North Central IPM Center, Northeastern IPM Center, of course, Facebook uh, page on SWD management. We have uh, uh, a Blueberry blog uh, out of UGA and similar website from uh, University of uh, uh, Michigan State University. And these are just a few of the resources, but we have lots of resources. If you need information, please contact your local uh, extension personnel uh, and then get in touch with one of our team members if you need more information about biological control or any other aspect of uh, 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 SWD management. We'll be glad to, to uh, help as much as we can. With that, uh, thank you all very much for uh, joining this webinar today. We really appreciate it. And this webinar was made possible by funding of this uh, project by USDA NEPA, uh, Specialty Crop Research Initiative, and also several other uh, funding agencies provided funds to uh, complete the work that was uh, presented here and has been presented in the past as part of this project. We will continue working and we'll continue updating you again as we make progress on different aspects of SWD management. With this, I will uh, thank you again very much for joining in. And at this point, we will open our Q&A session. If you have any questions, please type in Q&A. Uh, uh, and also, just stick around uh, and we'll be glad to respond to those questions uh, here. So thank you again very much. Joe, back to you. Okay. And we have quite a few questions in the Q&A. Uh, appreciate all of you putting them in there. It makes it easier than digging it out of the chat. The first one is, um, Gnapsis was not released in Connecticut. Um, there's lots of orchards there, specifically sour and sweet cherry. Um, is there a champion in Connecticut? Or you mentioned this offer that that just contact you and and a release will happen. If you don't know your local person, Who's the point of contact? How do I get in touch? Joe, that's a wonderful question. And we do have a champion in uh, Connecticut, actually, Rich Coles. He's, I think, Connecticut, uh, Connecticut Ag Experiment Station. Uh, he responded to that question in the Q&A as well, uh, in part. And uh, he would be the person, he's not part of this team, but he has worked with uh, lots of members of this team in the past on SWD. And he will be able to find ways to connect with the team to arrange, make arrangements for to, to release these the natural enemies, exotic natural enemies there. And added to that, we are still trying to get the final permission for all those states that were outlined in yellow. Um, the USDA APHIS has changed their online system and they requested to have only one permit for all the new states. So this next permit I write will just be for all of the United States. So we don't have any of these issues of, of uh, interstate transport. We cannot move Leptopolina around from state to state. You can ask your county A commissioner to move it within the state, but it cannot be moved between states. There's no permit for that, but it'll get there eventually. Our next question, are parasites helpful for control if fruits ripen before their peak in August? I, I think um, we have to remember that the greatest impact is gonna be outside of the cash crop in those riparian areas and those non-target, those alternate host plants where we lower the spotted wing density. And so it's gonna lower the amount of inoculum coming into your cash crop. Um, and I think it's going to get it's going to change year after year after year. 
So uh, Xinqing was showing levels as high as 70% parasitism in some sample locations. That's far better than what we ever expected. Um, one thing that might be happening is we might be having what's called an ecological release because we don't have Asobara and some of the other parasitoids here that outcompete these two uh, in ripened fruit. So they might actually do better in some regions than what we're seeing in Asia. Well, and there's a related question that in Virginia, they've seen SWD more in later ripening fruit, such as wild elderberry, which ripens later than uh, domesticated. Do you plan to release parasites into the wild areas for wild elderberry or wild blackberry to, to target that reservoir? I think that's where most people are releasing the natural enemies. The, the Ganaspis is in some of these non-crop habitats where it's not going to be sprayed. And Shen King, uh, join in too with these questions. Yes. Yeah, this is indeed that we want to do now. We want to establish this wasp first by releasing this wide area as this nest disturbed. And hopefully, you know, we can hopefully it's better to wide widespread, bring down the overall population in the entire landscape. And so this, I think, is probably more realistically will help mm -hmm. to control the little bit of what's, I don't think it can control in the orchard directly. We want to bring down the population in the entire area. Remember too, that when this thing started, uh, we had to have these insects in quarantine for years and years and years. So when the permit finally arrived and we were allowed to release Gnaspis, um, we had been down to something around 50 individuals. So within two years, we're releasing somewhere close to 100,000. So our production is getting better at the different regional insectaries. Um, so those first years, releases were going to be lower simply because uh, we had to gear up, we had to learn how to do it, we had to find good sites, good collaborators. And so I think the next year will be a, a good year for release and then back off and see what kind of impact we get. Our next question is, what plants or food sources would support the adult parasitoids? Uh, I think there are a lot of different host plants, also we haven't tested yet. There are some studies showing, you know, um, some um, that, that, that haven't been tested yet. That, um, obviously, this wasp were feeding on honey, on nicotine, you know, this, and yeah, they probably not all that I would say, not a lot of host plants you know, providing food for those parasitoids. Uh, remember, it's it's a, it's common with natural with parasitoids, especially that something like sugar water or or honey water or nectar, what it does is it increases the longevity of the adult, and because these insects were producing eggs and ovipositing throughout their 20, 25, 20 day lifetime, um, the longer they live, the more they kill, and so it's not as much their fecundity as their longevity, which is increasing the numbers they can kill. Returning back to the topic of releases and permits and things like that, if someone's state is currently yellow, so there's no permit for release yet, they have to wait for that permit to come through. Is there a good mechanism for tracking the upcoming permit approval? If they're waiting for it, how are they going to know when a permit is finally approved? Um, I, su I suppose when I get uh, notice, I can put it on the website. Ash, does that sound correct? Easy to do? That is correct. Once we have permits for, uh, like Kent, you mentioned, for all states across the U.S., we will put that announcement up on the website. And again, we will also uh, uh, announce that through our presentations and uh, uh, webinars in the future. And Leptopolina as well is just moving on its own. And Ganaspis should be doing that once its numbers get up as well, if its numbers do get up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, next question. One of the fagitids uh, is well established in Connecticut based on high populations in unsprayed raspberries. Where would the closest release site have been? This is from Richard in uh, Connecticut. 
Uh, so as the map is sure, there's been at least now in New York and in Maine, in New Hampshire, this is a cruise size to connect it. And, and my guess is the fidgetity he's thinking about is leptopolina. And so that probably was just naturally uh, there, moving on its own, perhaps. Next question, with reference to the cold storage study, approximately how long is each life stage of Gnapsis, resiliensis? Um, what's the best way to know when the parasitoid is in the pupil stage? So, Shin King, what do you think? These things are yeah. about 28 days? So, it depends on the temperature. So, at the point of like 22 uh, Celsius degree, it, the wasp developed totally in about 30 days. And the larva stage are about 20 days, and the pupil stage are about 10 days, depending on temperature. So, for this study that the, um, the, the uh, Fabrizio in Kensnab, so I think it, uh, the they found the total, they, they, I think they did a 22, 23 degree. And so they basically they, um, can see the development personal novel in about 15 to 20 days. And then the pupil emerging about five, six days. Yeah, so, so depending on temperatures. Okay. Next question, any idea how cold the parasitoids can survive in winter? So uh, we had Evelyn Hogarty uh, did some work in Berkeley and what she showed was a, a very slight temperature change in fall down to about 50 degrees Fahrenheit caused the uh, larva to go into an overwintering stage. Um, so it probably will vary depending on region, depending on acclimation. But it it tends to overwinter, we believe, as a larva um, inside a spotted wing. Does that make sense, Shin King? Yeah, I think so. I think there's several studies have done uh, in Canada. I think they think the novel or maybe the pupil stage or probably the stage of the mm -hmm. overwintering diapos, as well as uh, can measure the study did at the King Snap. And we don't know how long a dog can live in, in the field. I, I think some some lab I know that during this kind of experiment, the result has not come off yet. Um, but I don't think they can live in for the entire winter. But but that, you know the study is still going on. They were found in some pretty cold regions of Korea. Yeah. Okay. Um. Is there a parasitism threshold to say that the introductions are su successful or not? Um, so it's always difficult to, for me to categorize classic biocontrol success because some folks believe it's established, if you can establish the natural enemy, that's a success. Um, here's what I'll say. Uh, we had no problem finding spotted wind drosophila in South Korea and China. This is not going to be one of those classic biocontrol programs where spotted wind completely disappears. It will help suppress the population. And again, that we're getting up to 50% parasitism in some sites, I think is, is spectacular already. Uh, but it's not going to ever make spotted wing disappear is my guess. Um, we have a more specific question. There's a diversified berry farm in South Carolina with several more berries in the test phase. Rabbit eye blueberry is our biggest crop. Does having susceptible berries present from late May to mid-November facilitate population suppression of SWD? Wow, that might be a question for Ash. Mm. Okay, let me, okay, bear rabbit eye is does having susceptible berries present from late May to mid-November facilitated population suppression of SWD. That, that's a good question. That will uh, offer uh, opportunity, more opportunity, more time for the uh, parasitoids to work on SWD. 
and hopefully they will have a, a more a noticeable impact. But we don't know yet. And uh, Walker, again, is one of our collaborators in South Carolina uh, that we will we'll work with, uh, or we may have already done some releases there and we'll continue working with him. Thank you. Is there a screen size that might physically exclude spotwing Drosophila while being permeable to these wasps? So um, there is, Shinking, I don't know if you know it exactly, but uh, Jaina, uh, Lee and Steve Van Trimmer and some other people did some work on that specifically, uh, which is in draft form, but yes, there is a screen size. Um, and Shin King, I will try to look up to see if I still have that copy of that manuscript. Yeah, um, yeah, that the papers just come off the, by uh, Gina and Philip from Maine and Gina. They, they, they test several different size. Uh, I don't remember the exact size. I think that they did, yes, yeah, some screen size you can exclude the following, but a lot of wasp in and out. And last question we currently have in the queue, not on biocontrol necessarily, but what effort have you made to see what the effect of superior micronutrition and soil biology would have on SWD, driving less attractiveness to fruit? I, I've not worked on that, so I would have to pass that on to someone else. Yeah, I, yeah, I am not aware of this also. Yeah, that's that's a, a really good question, but we mm -hmm. have not really focused on as part of this project uh, on sort of a, a host plant resistance type uh, uh, characteristics of plant. Uh, but that's that's a that's an area that could be uh, investigated to see if there is any correlation between better nutrition, healthier plant, and uh, its uh, vulnerability to SWD infestation. There is a comment somebody made about protect netting, excluding SWD. Uh, I think when when the paper gets published on excluding SWD plus allowing the uh, parasitoid through, that'll be that'll be good to see. Um, with that, I believe we've made it through all the questions that we currently have. We greatly appreciate everybody attending and actively participating in this. When you do close out of the webinar, you're gonna be prompted with a survey. If you want to have more events like this, it's really helpful if you fill out that survey to let us know what you thought of this and how it can be made better. It's one of those things that when you're going for funding, they like to know that you're doing good outreach and that people really liked the, the uh, presentations that were given. So take a good 60 seconds, fill out that survey when this ends and let us know what you thought of this presentation. It really helps us to put this stuff forward. The things we have to do for verifying uh, people are enjoying the material. With that, um, Ash, do you have anything else to say in closing? Again, thank you all very much for joining in and uh, stay tuned. We will continue to make progress and keep you updated. Everyone have a wonderful evening and a great holiday season.